Mary Louise Timmerman, right from G&G. &G. She's one of our own here at Yale. Uh, she received her master's in mathematics and theoretical physics from Cambridge. What this means is that uh, Mary Louise uses mathematics to explain natural processes. Um, she, she did her postdoc at Woods Hole, right, which is one of the preeminent oceanographic institutes really in the world. And when she finished there, um, they signed her on as an assistant scientist, um, where she stayed for four years. Uh, the geology department um, poached her or stole her in 2007 and then promoted her last year. Yeah. Just recently, she received a, an NSF Career Award, which is a major investment from the NSF in Mary Louise's teaching and uh, research. And so basically, what, what, one of the major things that Mary Louise studies is the exchange of, of heat and salt in the ocean. And anyone who's taken an oceanographic course, this is where it all begins, right? You can't explain sort of the transfer of heat and and salts in the ocean, you cannot work on biogeochemistry, you cannot work on organismal behaviors or anything. Um, and in particular, as you'll see, um, she focuses heavily in the Arctic. And she is at the forefront of studying how continued warming in the Arctic alters the exchange of heat and salt in the Arctic Ocean. But not only that, and perhaps more importantly, how the changing of the dispersal of heat in the Arctic then feeds back and influences climate itself and influences such important things as sort of the prevalence of sea ice in the Arctic, which I'm guessing we'll also hear about. Um, here at Yale, she just recently received the Dylan Hickson Prize for Teaching Excellence in Science and Mathematics. Um, I've been really looking forward uh, to her seminar today. Let's give her a round of applause and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. So today, um, as Pete said, we're going to have um, an overview of the Arctic Ocean and climate. And we'll talk about some of the main processes that have been going on in the Arctic with a particular focus on the ocean component. But the first thing we think about when we think about the Arctic is sea ice. So sea ice is frozen water. When the atmosphere is very cold in the Arctic, and, um, and it freezes the ocean. We know that fresh water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, but seawater, like when you put salt on your sidewalk in the wintertime, freezes at a lower temperature. Seawater freezes at about minus two degrees Celsius compared to fresh, the fresh water at zero degrees Celsius. And as the ocean freezes, uh, the salt in the seawater is rejected from the crystal lattice in this process called um, brine rejection. And so the surrounding water becomes saltier and denser as sea ice grows on the surface of the ocean. And sea ice is fresh, um, the, especially the older sea ice. It's fresh. It's so fresh that you can chop it up and put it in your drink. Um, so it's a really, it really is a distillation process, this sea ice. So the main reason why we might care about sea ice is because of this well-known phenomenon that sea ice has a high reflectivity, sea ice and snow, or a high albedo. So about 80% of the incoming solar radiation onto the surface of the sea ice is reflected back to the atmosphere. And you can contrast this with solar absorption into the surface ocean uh, the much darker surface ocean where only about 10% of the incoming solar radiation is reflected back to space. So sea ice is a reflector. And in this way, it moderates the temperature of the Arctic and also the global temperatures. So this high reflectivity of the sea ice. And this, um, this high reflectivity property of sea ice and snow cover um, is what is um, oftentimes this uh, concept in global climate change called polar amplification, which means that the poles are warming at a, at a faster rate than the mid-latitude ice-free regions. Um, this is often attributed to sea ice losses. So we know about this phenomenon called um, polar amplification 
from the long-term climate record from, from cores. We see that when, when the Earth warms, the, uh, the Arctic regions get preferentially warmer. And also from the modern historical climate record, and also future climate model project projections. We can see that um, the Arctic um, will and has been warming at a faster rate. Th this, is a, this, this graph behind me is a, um, is a NASA graph of surface air temperatures. And what the colors show is the surface air temperature change over the past 30 years. So in most of the world, in, in, if you take a global average over most of the globe, the surface air temperature change has been about a degree global average. And you can contrast that with surface air temperature changes in the polar regions of about three degrees uh, in the past 30 years. So this is this concept of polar amplification that relates um, largely, there are all kinds of different factors that scientists attribute this polar amplification to, but it relates largely to this, to this concept that um, you can have more heat absorbed into the earth when you get rid of your sea ice and uh, snow cover in the north. So let's continue this thread of sea ice. Um, sea ice has a very strong seasonal cycle. Sea ice covers about an area of about twice the size of the USA. And every winter, we lose about half of our sea ice cover through melt and the sea ice of course, also gets blown around by the winds and pushed out of the Arctic region and into, into the lower latitudes where it can also melt. Um, the sea ice reaches its maximum extent every March, and this is shown here um, in this satellite image from the, or satellite composite from the National Snow and Ice Data Center, uh, showing the March sea ice extent in white um, last winter when the sea ice was at its, at its highest extent. And the, the, the orange line here is the median ice edge between 1981 and 2010. So you can think of that as a longer term um, mean ice edge. And it looks okay in the winter time. Things look pretty good. Um, we have to remember here that this is only the, only the sea ice extent. And I'll show you a movie on the next slide and you'll see that now we have a much thinner newer ice pack that's much more susceptible to being um, melt, melted each year and being blown around by the winds and pushed to, to lower latitudes. Um, and then sea ice reaches its minimum extent every September each year. On September 10th this year, the National Snow and Ice Data Center said, okay, we're, we're at the minimum of sea ice extent and now our satellite measurements are showing that sea ice is starting to increase now. Sea ice is starting to grow and there's no more melt taking place. Um, so, and that you can see here, this is the September sea ice extent last month, the, the mean over the month in white. And you can see it, it, now this is the thing that everyone's talking about with the loss of Arctic sea ice. It's um, much smaller extent than the median. I'll show you a time series of that too. Um, so like, like I said, um, th this, this, uh, this sea ice pack is thinning, it's getting younger, um, less old ice now in the Arctic because it's melting out. And I'm gonna show you, this, this movie from NOAA shows that in the colors are what you, can, what you can think of as ice age. Older ice is thicker ice because it's had longer to grow in the Arctic. And the new ice is the, is, the, is the blue and the older ice, more than nine years old, some of it, is the white. And it started in 1987, and now you can see, watch the seasonal cycle as the sea ice is at its maximum. It's got all that, that one, that, that blue color is the sea ice that just formed that winter. So it's just one year old, and it grows and decays. And what you can see that's most obvious from this is the white areas are, are shrinking. So that older, thicker ice we're losing. And now we have a much, a much more thinner, more vulnerable ice pack in the, in the Arctic. Um, so if we look at, um, we can quantify that in a time series. We've had satellite measurements of Arctic sea ice since 1979. So this shows the satellite record of sea ice extent in millions of square kilometers every September. This is the extent every September when sea ice is at its minimum.
So it's only the summer. If I were to show you the winter, the March in sea ice extent, we lose about 3% per decade. But it's, it's more of a much more horizontal line um, at, the, at, at, oops, at the top of this graph across here kind of thing. Um, so we, we, see that we see the sea ice extent is um, declining at a rate of about 13% per decade. And now I'm going to tell, so that, that's, our, that's our sort of introduction to sea ice. And um, as Pete said in his introduction, um, what I do is try to understand how the ocean influences sea ice cover and vice versa. So the ocean's relationship to sea ice cover and climate. And to lead into that, actually, I'm going to show you a couple of images. These are images of, of sea ice. These are, these are images from a plane a NASA plane taken about 500 meters above the sea ice in the Beaufort Sea in fall, just north of Alaska in fall. And I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to impress on you this picture that sea ice is not just this vast white sheet, but rather it's made up of all of these complicated flows that jostle around and are, um, and are blown by the winds and subject to freezing and so on. So you can see that these are ice flows of all various sizes here. And you can see these black, these black or dark regions here. That's the ocean. And that gives you a real, really good feel for how much um, you can absorb, how absorptive those oceans are compared, the open ocean waters are compared to the sea ice. So it's got lots of uh, snow on here and, and high reflectivity also. Feel free to interrupt if you have any questions about any of this. So, so this is sea ice. It's a very complicated flow field. Here's another picture of this. I, I wanted to show this picture because in the entire field pretty much is sea ice. Even this stuff up here, this is all sea ice. It's called nihilus ice or grease ice. That's sort of just when, when the sea ice first starts to form on the surface of the ocean. And it gets um, blown around by the winds and, and um, and also the ocean currents below. And you can see that in this kind of ribbony structure. And what you can see here, this gives you an appreciation for how difficult it is in the Arctic um, when we think about contaminants or, or oil spills or something on the surface of the Arctic Ocean. It's very difficult to delineate um, the spread of contaminants, such as oil or something, from, from these, these various different types of ice, and that's one of the things that people who are, who are needing to monitor these things are, are studying right now. So just like a sea ice is very complicated, the ocean system below is very complicated. Um, it's got a complicated temperature and salinity structure on a range of different scales, from the scale of the whole basin, thousands of kilometers, down to, um, down to centimeter scales. And so we need to understand this whole range of scales and processes if we're to understand how the ocean impacts the sea ice cover. So first of all, um, we, we need to look at a, um, a map, and we need to see the topography, the seafloor topography of the Arctic Ocean. Because ocean currents in the Arctic are, uh, are steered by these under, underwater submarine ridges and mountains. Um, they're, they're steered by the, the, the underwater topography. And um, obviously, the Coriolis effect has an important role in, in ocean currents. And, and also, the density of the water. And the density of the water is influenced by sea ice growth and decay processes, river inflows into the Arctic, and inflows from the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. So it's got this kind of complicated underwater topography here. And, um, and then in the right panel is a schematic depiction of ocean currents. So ocean, the, the, the Arctic Ocean receives inflows from the Atlantic Ocean through the Barents Sea opening here and through Fram Strait here, Davis Strait here between Greenland and the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, and the Bering Strait <coughs> over here that separates the Pacific Ocean from the Atlantic Ocean. So we see we have inflows here. The red is, depicts the warm and relatively warm and salty waters. The blues depict relatively cool and fresh waters. And then we have these major gyre circulations that are driven by the wind um, acting on the ocean. This is, this is called the Beaufort Gyre. It's this large scale um, um, associated with the Arctic high pressure system. Atmosphere, ice, ocean, um, large scale clockwise flow in, in the Arctic. One, one also interesting thing in this, in this figure before we leave it 
is um, you see this dark blue region here and the, and the light blue region here to the north. That is um, a rough depiction of the, uh, um, of the subarctic front that separates ocean water masses whose density are, is primarily set by temperature in the, low, in the lower latitudes here. When we go, when we go deeper in the, in the ocean, in the lower latitudes, it gets colder and colder and more dense and more dense. So that's thermally stratified, the ocean stratified by temperature. From the regions up here that are predominantly stratified by salinity. So fresh water is at the surface, salty water is at the bottom. And, um, and this is because at the cold temperatures of the polar oceans, if you vary the temperature a little, a little bit, it doesn't have a very large impact on the density of the seawater. The coefficient of thermal expansion is small at cold temperatures. Um, so uh, that, that's important. That will be important for, um, for what we're going to talk about heat content in the Arctic Ocean. Um, the, ocean, the Arctic Ocean is strongly stratified, much more so, at least in some regions, than the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, for example. That means that it's very light on the top and very dense on the bottom. With fresh water on the top, relatively fresh water on the top, and relatively dense water on the bottom. And in the Arctic Ocean, as you'll see in a minute, as you go deeper, unlike in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, it can get warmer. And it's that heat at great depth in the Arctic Ocean that um, oceanographers like myself try to study and understand. Well, another thing that oceanographers do is they, they um, look at the amount of relatively fresh water in the oceans. And this gives us an idea of, or, or less salty water, you could say, so-called freshwater content. This gives us an idea of the source of ocean waters in the Arctic. The Arctic Ocean is a big catchment basin. All, there's rivers that flow into the Arctic Ocean from all around the margins and make the surface of the Arctic Ocean relatively fresh. There's also ice sheet melting, the melting of ice sheets that is fluxed into the surface of the ocean as fresh water. And also, of course, the sea ice melts every year. And like I said before, the sea ice is fresh. And this also adds to the fresh water. And so that relatively fresh lid that's on the surface of the Arctic Ocean gets blown around and corralled by the winds. And that's what I'm showing here in this picture. This, this is a, the freshwater content. Um, so how much relatively fresh water is in the water column. And you can see this blob of anomalously fresh water over here. This is associated with that large scale clockwise um, atmospheric system that I mentioned. And what happens in the surface layer of the Arctic Ocean, there's a balance between friction and the Coriolis force such that all of this fresh water that's dumped into the Arctic gets corralled in this big freshwater center. And if you've, if you've ever heard conversations relating Arctic to climate, other than this whole concept of the ice, the reflectivity of the ice and snow, people also talk about Arctic freshwater and, and its impact on climate. And one of the reasons they talk about this is because right now in our contemporary Arctic, right now up there we have a blob of freshwater. These are based on measurements. We have this blob of freshwater. And if we have a relaxation of this large scale uh, clockwise circulation, if the winds slow down and relax, this blob, as we've seen in the past, has, can be released to the North Atlantic. And when fresh water is released to the North Atlantic from the Arctic, we can put a fresh water cap on the North Atlantic. This, this is very simplified you know, way of describing it. But we can put a fresh water cap on the North Atlantic, which inhibits that intense cooling that we have cooling and sinking that we have in the North Atlantic that's a major contributor to cold water in the world's oceans and contributor to global overturning circulation. And so um, scientists want to monitor this fresh water and this corralling of fresh water by the atmospheric circulation. Another reason why it's very important is because maybe many of you know the, the major ocean sink for atmospheric CO2 is in the North Atlantic Ocean. And that's because it, we've got deep convection there that can draw down the CO2. And so if you look at a map of CO2 uptake by the oceans, you just see this red blob in this region here. 
So what are we going to have if we have fresh water exiting the Arctic, stratifying the North Atlantic? We may, be, we may limit our ability, the ocean's ability to t take up CO2. But the main reason that we're going to care about fresh water today in, in this talk is because uh, fresh water impacts the stratification of the Arctic, which impacts the, the um, storage of ocean heat and release of ocean heat in the Arctic Ocean. So next I'll show you some measurements of the Arctic Ocean. And um, how do we measure the Arctic Ocean? Well, we can go up to the Arctic Ocean in an icebreaker, which we do every year. We go up into the Canadian Ar Arctic, into the Canadian Basin, um, and make measurements. But that's only in fall and summer when the ice pack is, um, is, is weak, and you can make your way in there by an icebreaker, and, and it's not very expansive. So we can make measurements via icebreaker in the, in the summer and fall and, and put, um, put, put instruments into the water from this icebreaker. This is the icebreaker that we, um, that we use for our yearly expeditions. That's a Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker. Um, so the National Science Foundation actually kind of charters this Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker um, every summer in, in, in this region of the Arctic. This icebreaker has, this is actually taken, the photo is taken from um, our ice station uh, where we're working on the ice, and the icebreaker is waiting for us. Um, it's not moving. The icebreaker has this particular icebreaker. They all work differently, but this one has a bunch of nozzles at the side, at the bow, that it shoots out compressed air out of the nozzles. So when, this, when the ice comes close to the ship, um, it can turn the bubbler system on and, and get, the, get the ice out of the way of the ship, and that's what it's doing here. <coughs> so here are measurements from an icebreaker transect across the Arctic Basin from Alaska all the way across to, to almost Svalbard. And this is going to cross these main, main underwater ridges. The main ridge is this Lomonosov Ridge, which, um, which was actually first discovered by oceanographers in the 1950s, not by looking at the seafloor, but by measuring ocean properties either side of this ridge and saying, oh, there must be an <coughs> underwater ridge there that's separating um, the transfer of water across these ridges. So. Um, so the, these, all these ridges separate the main basins, and we can see different circulation in each of these basins. So here's a, here's a, a section of temperature in the Arctic. I keep talking about warm Arctic waters, um, and we'll just see how warm they are. Uh, this, is, this is depth here, down to four kilometers, about two and a half miles depth. Um, and this is, this is the Alaskan side, and, and going across that green slice, we go across to this is um, a crossover by Svalbard over on the European side. And the colors are temperature, with the temperature scale is about minus one and a half degrees to um, one and a half degrees. So the first thing you see here is you see this band of warm water. Um, and, and it sits in the Arctic a couple of hundred meters below the surface. That is, that is derived from warm, salty water that inflows from the Atlantic Ocean. And the, the temperatures are, are only a few degrees above freezing. Remember I said that seawater freezes at about minus two degrees Celsius. But that's enough, there's enough heat in that warm band of water that's sitting at depth in the Arctic Ocean that if this heat were somehow to make its way to the surface, which presently for the most part it doesn't do, if it were to make its way to the surface ocean in contact with sea ice cover, it would entirely melt the sea ice pack, and we would have no Arctic sea ice uh, remaining. So, um, but, it, but it doesn't, because the Arctic Ocean is a very low mixing environment. It's covered. We, you can imagine how, um, how precarious this situation is, because the Arctic is covered by sea ice for most of the year which limits, acts as a buffer for wind input to the Arctic Ocean. So you've got the sea ice lid sitting on the Arctic Ocean. Um, less wind energy input, so less mixing up of the ocean, not like we see down here in the mid-latitude ice-free oceans. Um, also, tides are very weak, and also I keep talking about that very strong stratification, the fresh water and salty water below, um, prevents these, these warm waters from being mixed up to the surface. Uh, let, let's, look at, let's look at a profile now um, of, of temperature and salinity and density. So this is when we go in our ship and we, we send an instrument down from the ship to the seafloor and bring it back up and we can 
uh, we can not only measure its temperature and salt content, but we can measure CFCs and oxygen content and other geochemistry in the water. Um, so I'll show you the basic, this is a profile taken from right here. And as, as I told you before, the temperature, as you get deeper, um, can get warmer in these, in these kind of interleaving layers. And, th and the complexity of these interleaving warm layers that have this vast potential to melt sea ice is, is, what, is what I study. The salinity, on the other hand, looks fairly simple, fresh at the top, goes down salty at the bottom to about 35 parts per thousand. So seawater is about 35 parts per thousand. That means 35 grams of salt in one kilogram of salt water solution. That's seawater. At the surface in the Arctic, sometimes it can get very fresh, only like 12 parts per thousand. Um, so, and then, and then we see density. And density, the shape of the density looks very much like the uh, salinity curve. So, so this temperature, these, these, these temperature effects have only a small influence on the density of the ocean. Okay, so these are measurements from an icebreaker. And, um, and, but you, 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 you can ask now, well, how do you get measurements of the Arctic Ocean year-round, which can be a challenge because we can't get up there year-round. You can go up into the Arctic um, by aircraft in the spring, although even that's becoming more precarious now as we lose the sea ice. You can go up in spring when you have lots of ice pack um, and, and also it's light and so you can, you can actually see what you're doing because the sun has come back out in the Arctic. Um, but but the, tech, the main technique that we use is, um, is by uh, putting instruments into the sea ice cover, into what we can find as a permanent sea ice flow, those white bits that you saw in that movie. We go up there in Icebreaker, we take all our instruments, we find a nice sturdy flow that we think is going to be around for a year or two, and we put instruments in here. Um, and it's called an ice-based observatory. And, and these instruments send the data back via satellite to our computers back here so we can, we can um, see what's going on in the Arctic Ocean throughout, throughout the year. So these instruments measure, uh, for example, atmospheric properties, uh, snow, snow, ice, uh, or snow and ice properties, the thickness of the sea ice, the depth of the snow, um, and, and measurements that I'm going to show you today from what we call an ice tethered profiler, which is a buoy that sits in the sea ice, and below that is this long wire um, about, down to about 800 meters, and rolling up and down on this wire is a sensor that measures ocean properties. The, the Russians were, have been doing this since 1937. Obviously, these were manned ice camps, um, and there are still some manned ice camps today. Um, but we are seeing fewer of those because it is more dangerous with a, with a more unstable ice pack now. But the satellite transmission has revolutionized the way we, uh, we view the Arctic. So here are some measurements from one of these ice-tethered profilers. It has a surface buoy. This is, this is an instrument that has a bunch of batteries in it and moves up and down and makes measurements all the way through the water column to try to understand those warm layers that we see. Are they getting warmer? In what parts of the regions are they getting warmer? Where are they releasing heat to the sea ice cover? Um, and so on. What's the fresh water content in the Arctic Ocean? And that's shown here. Um, I said there were many, there were di uh, uh, several different warm interleaving layers, uh, and we'll show we'll show those here. This is this is a set top top is what we call a section of, of temperature with depth here and date here, um, running for one year through 20, 2009 and ten, um, and it was from one of these instruments that was blown around in that Beaufort gyre here. And it was kind of blown around. It was on a, it was sitting on its ice flow, and it was blown around. And the whole time it was blown around, it was rolling up and down like this, and and sending measurements back. And so we could come and sit in our offices and see what the Arctic Ocean looked like um, in midwinter. And then this is salinity. And as you can see from the salinity, the salt content is very low at the top, in this in the surface of the Arctic Ocean, and then it gets saltier as you get deeper. And this gradient in salinity is associated with a density gradient, which means that it's hard to mix water up. If you have water that's stratified, where you have dense water on the bottom, light water on the top, and you, you have to put a fair bit of energy, especially in the ocean, a fair bit of energy in to mix that up, 
And what you can see in the temperature is that you see this warm band of water that pretty much just sits there um, underneath the surface mixed layer, this underneath this blue stuff. It just sits under there, trapped by the stratification, not being able to, to get up to the surface. Um, although in, in some cases it does get to the surface. And, and um, we'll, we'll talk about that briefly. So, so the idea is that we have these, these, um, these layers that are, that are warm. And one of the most prominent changes in the Arctic in recent years has been a warming of the ocean layers. And this is because the ocean layers coming in from the Atlantic are warmer. The ocean layers coming in from the Pacific are warmer. And another reason, which is related to sea ice losses, that I'll, that I'll, that I'll tell you about next. Because we need to understand the source of this water and the implications for its heat loss to the Arctic. And to get at that, we can, we can look at this map, which is the solar heat input to the Arctic Ocean the, the linear trend between 1979 and 2005 in this case. And what you see is a lot of red, meaning that the amount of solar energy coming into the ocean is increasing. And the reason the amount of solar energy coming into the ocean is increasing is because we have uh, less sea ice now. So that exposes the dark ocean and the sun's rays can shine in. In, in Arctic climate, there's this very well-known ice albedo feedback mechanism where you, um, you, melt, you push back a little bit of sea ice or by the winds or you melt it a little bit. And then that means you, can, you have exposed water. And so that, can, that exposed water can absorb solar radiation. And then the sea ice drifts over the, the warm water that's been, that's been newly warmed. And that warm warming can melt more sea ice, and you can absorb more solar radiation into the open water, melt more sea ice, and so on. And this is this ice albedo feedback mechanism that is, um, that is largely the cause of the melt of sea ice over the past decades. Um, so you see lots of more solar input to the surface ocean. With the largest solar heat input increases of about 4% um, per year, over here in the Chukchi and Beaufort Gyre region where we've seen the biggest sea ice losses. So what happens to that solar heat input? Um, so um, a large fraction of it goes into melting sea ice. And we can see that, as I've just described, this ice albedo feedback mechanism. And we can see that by looking at these maps of sea surface temperature. This is a couple of months ago in August 2016 the um, monthly mean sea surface temperature in the Arctic. And the sea surface temperatures in the Arctic are between about uh, zero and, and eight or nine degrees with higher temperatures around the margins. This is, this is the Pacific Ocean over here where the, where the Pacific Ocean flows in and melts some sea ice. The white line is showing the sea ice extent for August. And over here in the Atlantic where the Atlantic flows in to the Arctic Ocean and around the margins. And then if we look at, um, at anomalies in sea surface temperature, so how much have these sea surface temperatures changed in August 2016 relative to past Augusts? You see a lot of red, and we see that in, in recent years, lots of red water where um, sea surface temperatures are a few degrees warmer in summer today than, than they used to be. And, um, and so, the, especially in regions like this that we've been monitoring off the west coast of Greenland, for example, where you see very warm sea surface temperatures. This is the Barents Sea, warm blobs of sea surface temperatures. All this contributes to meltback and over here. And every time in the summer when we see these warm sea surface temperatures, um, anomalously warm sea surface temperatures, they're associated with um, lots of meltback of the sea ice. So here's, here's this graph of sea ice extent in millions of square kilometers. And this is over the past um, satellite record we see. Um, and up here are sea surface temperature anomalies in August of 2007 and August of 2012. These were very low ice extent years. 
And um, 2007, we saw very warm waters, the warmest waters in the Arctic that we've ever seen, um, up to 10 degrees warmer in parts of the Arctic. Uh, and, and, and we saw extreme sea ice losses in 2007. And after the news in 2007, it, there, was this big, there was kind of a shift in atmospheric circulation, lots of warming, low sea ice. The sea ice dropped out here, and, um, and everyone panicked. And things looked okay the next year and after that. And then in 2012, we had a very similar situation where we saw warm ocean temperatures and, and sea ice losses. This year, um, this year the sea ice was about, this only goes up to 2015, but this year the sea ice was about the same actually as 2015. So, um, so you know, who's to say what's going to happen to this, to the sea ice, to the sea ice pack? So, I said, what happens to that solar radiation that, sh that shines into the surface ocean? A lot of it goes into melting the sea ice cover. A lot of it is um, just lost back to the atmosphere. And when it's lost back to the atmosphere in the fall, when the sea ice is trying to freeze again, it slows the growth of the sea ice cover or delays the onset of, of sea ice growth. And then the smallest fraction of it, um, and I would argue the most important fraction, is stored in the oceans. And it's stored in the oceans in, in, in that, in these, oops, sorry. Um, it's stored in the oceans in, in the form of these interleaving layers. So what happens is when the sun shines into the surface of the Arctic Ocean, I described how sea ice flows drift over and then get melted by this. And in a one-dimensional sense, when you have the sea ice, this fresh sea ice drifting over and being melted by the, the, the warm ocean waters, you can set up this fresh layer, this cold, fresh layer of melt water, and that ends up capping off the, 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 the rest of the warm water below. So there's some of it stored. Um, and, that's, and that's interesting, and, and, and that's one way of getting um, heat stored in the Arctic Ocean. But recently, we've, we've, um, we've realized another mechanism that's much more um, dynamic, and it has the capability to store much more heat in the Arctic Ocean, and this is driven by the winds. Uh, so, so how does that happen? How do we get the warm ocean that's at the surface, warmed by the sun in the summer, how do we get that down into the interior Arctic to stay there? Um, and, and slowly melt out over the course of the winter. Um, well, we, we, we can infer a mechanism by uh, noticing that the, if, we make, if, we look at, if we look at lateral, if we look at a gradient in lateral properties, say, from these boundary regions that I showed you that get warm every summer into these interior regions that are typically um, that are typically fresher and cooler. If we look at a lateral gradient between these warm regions and these interior regions, we can see that the properties this way map on to properties in the vertical. Uh, you can see that in this section of salinity here. These, these white lines are showing you salt contours. And you can see these salt contours come out at the top of the ocean. That means that there's a lateral gradient in ocean properties from salty water over in these regions to fresh water over in the center where the winds have piled up all of this fresh water. So we see this lateral gradient in salinity that maps on to a vertical gradient in salinity in the interior. In the North Atlantic Ocean, um, there is a process, an ocean process called um, ventilation of the thermocline. And um, so we asked the question, well, how do these properties get down into the interior ocean that are actually set at the surface? Properties like CFCs and CO2 and oxygen through atmospheric exchanges, how do they get into the interior? Well, the same mechanism as, as we get heat into the interior Arctic Ocean, we can get all of these properties into the interior North Atlantic Ocean via this thermocline ventilation. So what happens is the water properties that are in contact with the atmosphere that are set like this are influenced by dynamic effects, by the winds and, and so on, and they get actually pushed down and pumped down and follow their level of neutral density 
into the interior. So that's what we see. That's what we're seeing is happening in the Arctic. We're losing sea ice. We're warming the boundary regions, so we have very warm water there. And, um, and this warm water gets pumped down into the interior. And the way it gets pumped down is um, via the large-scale atmospheric circulation acting on the, on the surface Arctic Ocean. So here's a, here's a schematic here showing, um, showing a vertical slice in the ocean from these boundary regions into the interior regions where we see these warm layers sitting underneath the surface of the ocean. And, um, and what happens is the wind blows. It actually blows, um, it actually blows in a circle like this, a large-scale circle around this. And you have this lateral gradient in wind. So you have strong winds over here, weak winds over here. And the strong winds over here lead to water being pushed, lots of water being pushed here. The weak winds over here lead to a little bit amount of water being pushed here. And the rest of the water has nowhere to go, and it has to get pumped down into the, into the interior like this. It gets warmed up and pushed down in continually. All summer long, this happens. So we're just flushing the Arctic with warm water. And, and so we said, well, why, you know, what's to stop it in wintertime? Why doesn't that warm water get flushed out again? Well, in wintertime in the Arctic, it gets cold, obviously. The rivers all stop flowing into the Arctic, so the surface um, be, is, is now less fresh. We have sea ice growth, which, like I said before, is, as the ocean freezes, salt is rejected from the crystal lattice, and we have brine rejection making the surface ocean saltier. So we have an ocean surface that looks more like this in winter. It's salty and cold. And, but the winds are still blowing. They're still blowing in this climatological, climatological pattern just around and around the Arctic high pressure system like this. And they, they continue to pump water into the interior. But the water that is being pumped into the interior is denser than the, water that, the warm water that's pumped into the interior in summer. So we get dense water being pumped down, ventilating this part of the Arctic, and leaving this part largely untouched to do its thing in the, in the wintertime. So if we, look at, if we look at data now, these are, these are the same measurements where we have very warm water like this in the, in the, at the surface in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, we have the cold surface, but we have this slug of warm water that remains throughout the year. OK, so, so what? Um, I've, I've told you about, um, about these warm layers in the Arctic Ocean. And now, um, now we want to understand uh, what this means. So, so I, said, um, I said that we have warm water shining into the surface of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, it melts the sea ice. Most of it goes into melting the sea ice. And um, some of it gets lost to the atmosphere. And then a, a fraction of it gets stored in the ocean. So here's just a, a case study example. Here we're going to look at, um, at the cumulative heat content into the, into the ocean, where the total height of each of these bars is the, is the total heat content that's been absorbed in a certain region of the Arctic Ocean, in a region where we see, where we, where we have measurements, actually, where we have measurements of, of the bottom melt of sea ice so that we can close the heat um, budget and figure out what's happening with the sea ice cover. So the total height of each of these bars is the total heat content into the upper ocean. And most of that heat, the, that, the cumulative heat content, goes into melting the bottom of the sea ice flows. Um, sea ice is about, uh, it has a total thickness, say, of, of two to three meters. And in one summer, we might lose about a meter of that in a typical melt year. Um, so, and, and then the rest of that heat is just lost. A small amount is stored in the oceans. And that small amount that, of heat that's stored in the oceans, over the course of fall and winter, it gets mixed up when we have winter storms that make the ice move fast relative to the ocean, and, and there's a strong shear like this, and that mixes up that heat that's right underneath the, right underneath the mixed layer. 
And we also have sea ice growth, which rejects this dense water that sinks down and can draw up that heat. And we find that in a, in a year after we have a typical summer of sea ice extent, and we don't absorb too much solar radiation into the surface ocean, that the, that, um, that the total heat loss from the ocean only contributes a very tiny fraction of the, of the total sea ice melt over that following year. But in a year such as that 2007 year that I showed you with that big red blob of warm water and very low sea ice extent, we had a lot of heat that was trapped in the Arctic Ocean and was later released over the course of the year that's showing, shown in these bars here. It was later released in the fall and winter to melt the sea ice pack. And the result of this, in this simple study, was, says that the loss of stored heat in winter following that summer of intensive solar heat input um, was equivalent to about a quarter of the sea ice growth over that season. So the, so the, so the story is that if we continue to have um, intense solar heat input into the surface Arctic Ocean, uh, we'll continue to store larger volumes of heat and, um, and this will lead to uh, um, compromi a compromised sea ice pack the following year. So this is what I've just said now. Um, increased solar absorption into the upper Arctic Ocean is a factor in recent sea ice losses and the sea ice albedo feedback mechanism has been one of the main mechanisms for sea ice melt back in recent years. The bottom of sea ice is melting more than the top of the sea ice. Um, so we think warm temperatures, the sea ice pack is, is melting. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Warm temperatures mean warmer ocean temperatures, mean thinner sea ice and melt from below. Um, and then when in recent summers, we're seeing more and more stored heat in the Arctic um, following that summer. And that heat can come out of the ocean in the, during the times when the sea ice pack is most vulnerable. It means a lot more if that heat is released when it's underneath sea ice cover than if it's released to the atmosphere. Um, so, and, and this can have um, a substantial effect on, on the resulting sea ice thickness. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Time for questions. All right, thanks for, very much for your talk. My name is Peter. I have uh, two questions. First of all, uh, you've showed us a lot of interesting uh, figures and graphs and results. I'm interested, what kind of mathematical models do you use to, to uh, carry out your research? And uh, second of all, is there any uh, predictive capability with the model? So, or if, you, if you're looking at like the yearly trend in uh, ice cover, if, if it's going to be a very low amount of cover one year, can you say something about what it's going to be like the next year and, and vice versa? So, so um, my, the techniques that I mostly use are ideal, idealized numerical models um, to constrain some of our analytical, like mathematical models, geophysical fluid dynamical models. So for example, in, the, in, those, in those pictures that I showed you about the wind energy input to the upper ocean and this convergence driving a flow like this, we need to understand um, the, um, the equations of motion for the fluid. So we need to understand um, how the, the dynamic forcing and the thermodynamic forcing couple. So a lot of that is really uh, pencil and paper stuff, but then you can only get so far with that and we use idealized numerical models and I also work with climate modelers. Um, uh, predictability of the Arctic sea ice is, um, is a pretty sketchy business um, because of all of these complicated factors that go into um, what that go into the fate of the Arctic sea ice in any given year. Um, so after that extreme sea ice loss in 2007, uh, people were all, were all just huddled around their computers and, and pencils trying to figure out what, you know, what went on. And, um, and they're still talking about this. So um, because you've got winds, you can have anomalous wind patterns that blow the sea ice just at the right time 
and, um, and, and, and leave the ocean exposed, and then you can have this ice albedo feedback. Um, because the large scale atmospheric circulation patterns and the small scale uh, play so much of a role in these feedback mechanisms, it's very hard to predict. Um, of course, I'd be very surprised if we saw a recovery of our sea ice pack. Um, but I wouldn't be very surprised if next year we saw tons of sea ice again. Um, but it's always going to go like this. Hey, uh, I have a question about uh, predictability of Arctic sea ice. Um, I've seen some models that show a complete disappearance of summer sea ice in less than a decade. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is it likely, unlikely, based on your experience? And secondly, how would that change some of the currents that you described? Yeah, so for a long time to come, we're going to have sea ice in the winter time. The, 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 the atmosphere gets so cold that the ocean is going to freeze. Um, a lot of the predictive models, we, or a lot of these models that ha have these predictions, they're, um, they're tuned uh, because there are so many processes that can't be resolved in a global climate model, like these ocean mixing processes. None of the models, not, not, not one of the models, can capture these, these thin these thin warm layers, right? Their, their vertical resolution is too small, the mixing in them is too high, so these, these sort of delicate features are just sort of lost in the mix. Um, and that's not even to mention the issues that are involved with parameterizing uh, the sea ice, sea ice growth and decay processes interfacing with the ocean. Um, so, I, I don't know. We have to just keep trying to understand the processes that are impacting Arctic sea ice and do the best we can in terms of projections out into the future. Um, the oceans are getting warmer and the, the air temperatures are increasing. Neither of these bode well for sea ice cover in the next decades. Hello, my name is Yishan. I'm a first year MESC student here at FES. Uh, my question is, have we seen, <coughs> I'm sorry, have we seen any evidence of the release of that uh, freshwater blob in the Beaufort uh, circle into the North Atlantic and therefore shutting down the overturning circulation? And if that does happen, um, it's definitely a scary idea, but given that the turning, overturning circulation of the North Atlantic deep water travels down the basin within a time, time scale of hundreds of years. Is that something that we would worry in maybe my lifetime, or is, is it more of a longer impact? Thank you. Yeah, um, so this is, this is not, uh, it, in my opinion, this freshwater release from the Arctic is potentially painted as a more dire picture um, than, than it perhaps will be. We've seen, we see occasional releases of this fresh water. In recent years, we've seen a buildup of the fresh water and then it's kind of stabilized. And every few years, we see a bit of it pulsing out. But what happens when that fresh water is released um, is it is influenced by the Earth's rotation. And so it comes out and it, and it hugs the coast of Greenland, basically, in a boundary current. One of the things we're trying to understand now is how, how that water can be transported laterally. But what that means, that it doesn't just flood the North Atlantic as this cap, but it hugs as this boundary current. Um, what that means is it will have less of an impact on atmosphere-ocean exchanges over large regions of the, of the North Atlantic. Here's that picture that I just put at the end of, this is this, this is, this is an inventory of anthropogenic CO2 uptake by the oceans. And this is this concept that I mentioned of, um, of increased CO2, or large CO2 uptake in these regions of dense, uh, dense water formation. This is kind of a striking plot, um, that to think that 25% of the, of the atmospheric CO2 is absorbed in the, in the North Atlantic region. But we are very uncertain about the way that freshwater release will influence freshwater over the North Atlantic. 
So that is something that we can't make predictions of. There have been studies that may not have been physically justifiable in the past. That on there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, my question is: Do we know when the underside of the ice is uh, thawing with with the warm air or warm temperature kind of making its way under there? Do we know if that fresh water then sits as like a lens underneath the ice, or does it make its way out? And does that have anything to do with the upticks in ice reforming because of the lack of salt in the fresh water the year after? Yeah. So, um, so that, that fresh water that's formed at, this, at the surface uh, when we have sea ice melt, that is largely uh, subjected to that large scale circulation that basically keeps corralling it. In the, and that's kind of what, based on the last question, what we were just talking about. So it's kind of swept into the interior. Um, but at the same time, there's also mixing with the ocean below. So when we look at, at, at the you might think, oh, the Arctic Ocean um, is getting fresher and fresher because of sea ice melt. Um, but in fact, the sea ice, in terms of fresh water, is a net loss on the Arctic because it grows and, um, and it spits out a bunch of salt and it's like this. And a lot of it just gets blown right out into the North Atlantic before melting on the surface. So the proportion of, of fresh water that gets input to the Arctic Ocean is um, is actually smaller than that that gets exported by sea ice that gets blown by the winds and pushed out. Um, but the sea ice ultimately gets, the, or the fresh water ultimately gets corralled like this in that, in that Beaufort Shire. Okay, great, we have a class coming in, so um, we'll end there. Let's thank Mary Louise one more time.